The previous few videos in the quantum mechanics playlist have all been leading up to this video, where I will discuss the unit circle in the complex plane. We have talked about the trigonometric functions. Those are sine, cosine, and tan. We can actually use a Cartesian coordinate system for the complex plane. And if we're restricted to a subset of the complex plane, that is the unit circle, we can parameterize every point on the unit circle with these trigonometric functions. So what we're going to need is a definition for theta. Theta is our angle. So let's have a look at some conventions. This over here is a diagram of the unit circle. All of these red values over here are the angle theta in radians. And radians go from 0 to 2 pi. So 2 pi radians is a full revolution. We have talked about this in detail in the previous videos. So all of these blue uh, little brackets over here uh, contain the coordinates for each of these red points. And all of these red points are special points that live in the unit circle. So the entire plane is the complex plane. But this red circle is a subset of the complex plane, and it's a very special subset. The unit circle, by definition, has a radius of 1. And one of the very important things that we can do with the unit circle is we can use Euler's formula to represent all of the points on the unit circle. So we can take this representation over here, where we have a number on the left, comma, a number on the right, and we can turn that into this representation. This is a real component, and this is an imaginary component. So we can think of those Cartesian coordinates as being a real component and an imaginary component. We can actually superimpose a set of axes over this diagram. So over here, we can have a horizontal axis, and over here, we can have a vertical axis. We could call those axes the x and y axis, or alternatively, we could call them the real and imaginary axes. And the real and imaginary components are going to be the same as the x and y components. So that's what we are actually describing when we use Cartesian coordinates. Euler's formula over here allows us to go from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates. So this would be the polar representation of a complex number. And numbers that satisfy this form are always going to sit on this red circle, the unit circle. And this is very important because this keeps appearing in physics again and again. And in quantum mechanics, it is essential that we understand the complex exponential. So now what I want to do is I want to go through some of the details of this diagram, and then I'm going to do some examples, uh, and some examples where we'll put different values of theta over here, and then we're going to get different values or different representations in the Cartesian form of the complex number. So let's try and understand what's going on in this diagram. So as I said before, theta uh, is given by these red values over here. And I've picked some very special values. These are the values that we were talking about in the previous few videos, where we were talking about those special triangles. We had the right isosceles triangle and the 30, 60, 90 triangle. And that's how we got these uh, coordinates over here. So these coordinates uh, actually come from those videos. So make sure you check out those videos uh, before you continue on with this video. So all of these values are positive. That's because in this top right quadrant, both the real and the imaginary component are positive. But if you go into the other four quadrants, you're going to see minus signs everywhere. You'll see the same magnitudes, right? We've got the same numbers over here, but they have minus signs in different places. That's because what we're doing is we're reflecting this quadrant into the other quadrants. So all of the distances are the same, but they're just in different directions. So if we're in this quadrant over here, and then we reflect over onto this quadrant, what's going to happen to the values? Well, these guys are going to remain positive, but these guys are going to turn negative. Why is that the case? Well, these values actually tell us the horizontal component. The vertical component is still positive, because up here we have a positive vertical value. But the horizontal value is negative. And if we go down into this quadrant, both the vertical and the horizontal value are negative. That's this bottom quadrant. And in this quadrant, we just have a positive value for the horizontal component, and the vertical component is negative. So the vertical component is negative below the horizontal axis. And uh, this, uh, beyond this side, we have a negative value for the vertical component and a positive value for the uh, 
the horizontal component. So that is some important uh, details as to why there are plus signs and minus signs all over the place. What about these green values? Well, these green values are the ratio of the vertical component and the horizontal component. And we can think of that as the tan of the angle. So the tan of the angle is sine of the angle over the cosine of the angle. That is the definition of tan. That is one of our basic trigonometric functions. So it actually gives us some insight into how these two values are related to each other. So you can see that we have a consistent set of three values that are also either being positive or negative as we go around. Because the sign of both the horizontal and vertical components are the same in this quadrant and in this quadrant, we have positive values. But because in this quadrant and in this quadrant we have differing signs, that leaves us with a minus sign. That's why we have negative tan values over here and over here. So those are some interesting details in the diagram. An interesting exercise you could go through is try and reconstruct this diagram by yourself just by using these uh, little values in the top right quadrant. If you add these values and you keep adding them going around and then simplify the fractions, you should get all of these numbers as well. And it's a trivial exercise to uh, reflect these values from the previous video that we got from those special triangles. So now what I want to do is provide those examples. Why do we even bother with this diagram? Well, we need this diagram to help us out. We need it to help us visualize this relationship over here. So let's uh, pick some very interesting values for theta. So just as a reminder, theta is defined to be zero along the positive real axis. So in this video, I'm using real and horizontal interchangeably, and I'm using imaginary and vertical interchangeably. Because uh, in this visual representation, those are just interchangeable terms. So let's start off with uh, e to the i zero. What happens if we put theta equals to zero? So this is by convention zero, and this is a positive angle. Going around this way is positive. Going around this way is negative. But we won't uh, bother with negative values of theta in this video. So let's try and put a theta value of zero. So that's going to give us e to the i times zero. What is that going to be? Well, if we look at this little blue thing over here, it tells us the coordinates. So it tells us that the real component is one and the imaginary component is zero. So how would we write that in this form? Well, we'd have cosine of theta would be one and sine of theta would be zero. So we wouldn't have an imaginary component. This imaginary unit, i, is just multiplied by 0. So this is actually the same as e to the 0, which is equal to 1. And that is uh, actually very important to, to stress in this diagram, because this is the real axis. So because the unit circle is going over here, this has to be 1. This is the real number 1. But as we go away from this area over here, and as we increase the angle, we're going to go into complex numbers. So these are not purely real numbers anymore. These guys are complex numbers now. So the unit circle only intersects the real axis at two points. It intersects it over here and over here. So let's try and put pi radians as the angle theta. If we do that, that's going to give us e to the i pi. And what is e to the i pi? Well, we have minus 1 over here and we have 0. So there's no imaginary component. We just have minus 1. And this may look familiar. If we move this minus 1 to the other side, that's going to give us e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. This is a very famous formula. This is Euler's identity. And it brings together a lot of the most famous constants or numbers in mathematics. We have 1, we have 0, we have e, we have i, and we have pi. And they're all linked together in one beautiful equation. So these are some of the simple cases where we're just on the real axis. But now let's have a look at what happens if we're on the imaginary axis. The unit circle intersects the imaginary axis at two points as well. We've got this point over here and this point over here. So let's have a look at those points too. So let's put in pi on two radians as our angle theta. So e to the i pi on two. What is that going to be? Well, we're going around this way. And that's going to tell us these coordinates over here. So 0 is our real component, 
and one is our imaginary component. So the imaginary component one multiplies the imaginary unit i, and that just leaves us with i. So this is one way of representing i. i is exactly the same as e to the i pi on two. Now this may look a little strange if, if this is the first time you're seeing it, because what you have is an exponential being raised to some imaginary number, and that's giving you the imaginary unit i. But this is very consistent with what we have and all the framework of complex numbers that we've been building up in these videos. Now let's have a look at the other spot where the unit circle intersects the imaginary axis. So that's this point over here. So if we go three pi on two radians, so that's three quarters of the way around the circle. So the reason this isn't three quarters, and the reason it's three on two, is because a full revolution is not pi radians, but it is two pi radians. Now that is a subtle point that is a common point of confusion. So that's why some people like to advocate the use of tau as an alternative to pi. Uh, but we won't get into that debate in this video. So let's put three pi on two as our value of theta. So that's gonna give us e to the i times three pi on two. And what is that equal to? Well, we can see from the diagram that we don't have any real component, but we do have an imaginary component, and that imaginary component is negative one. So negative one is the sine of three pi on two. And that means that our uh, overall value for the complex number is minus i. So we have minus i over here. And you can see there's a little pattern over here. So we have one, minus one, i, and minus i. Those are actually the powers of i. So this one over here is equal to i to the zero. And this one over here is equal to i squared. This one over here is equal to i to the power of one. And what about this one? Well, this one is i to the power of three. So we have four powers of i. And what would, it, what would happen if we went i to the power of four? Well, we just go back because this is a cyclic group. We're just starting and we go zero, one, two, three, and then we go back to where we came from. Why is this the case? Well, i is actually a 90 degree rotation in the complex plane. So have a look at this. If we multiply i by zero times, we're at the identity, we're at one. So we're at the starting point. But what happens if we multiply by i twice? So we have i squared. Well, that's gonna take us all the way to the other side. That's minus one. And we're used to that when we're just dealing with real numbers. Real numbers, when you multiply by minus one, you go from the positive side to the negative side. So it's like a 180 degree rotation, or pi radians. And what if you multiply by i just once? Well, if you multiply by i one time, that's like going halfway. Right? You're not going all the way to the negative axis, you're going halfway. You're going to the imaginary axis, and that's a 90 degree rotation. So you can break this minus one up into two smaller rotations. You can break it up into a first multiplication by i, and then a subsequent multiplication by i. So then i squared is gonna give you minus one. But then if you multiply by i one more time, that's gonna give you i cubed. And i cubed is gonna take you three quarters of the way around the circle. And one more multiplication is actually gonna take you back to the beginning. So uh, this guy is also the same as i to the power of four. So what you actually have here is modular arithmetic. This is just like uh, reading the numbers of a clock, except a clock has got 12 little numbers around, and this just has four numbers around. So it's like a clock with four numbers. So we've talked about these simple cases, and these are the cases where the imaginary and real axes actually intersect the unit circle. And this is a very important uh, little subset of values because they form a very interesting group. And this is a, a, a very abstract uh, concept in mathematics. So now let's have a look at some other interesting values. We don't have to pick just these values. We can pick any arbitrary value. Let's pick pi on four as our value of theta. So that's gonna give us a real and imaginary component that are the same. They're both root two on two. So what is that gonna look like? Well, we're gonna have e to the i times pi on four, and that's gonna be equal to, what is our real component? Root two on two, and our imaginary component is root two on two as well. So this is a representation over here. And we can also represent this in a different way. 
we can set this equal to, we know that root 2 on 2, that's the same as 1 on root 2. So both of these guys are actually the same value. And I'll write this out in full over here. So I'll just factor out a root 2 on 2, and I'm going to get a 1 plus i over here. And this guy we can turn into 1 on root 2 just by multiplying. Uh, and, and if you take this guy and you multiply both the top and the bottom by root 2, you'll get this one. If you, if you multiply the top by root 2, you get root 2. If you multiply the bottom by root 2, you just get 2. So that's why these guys are the same. So this multiplies 1 plus i. And what do we have? Well, we have 1 plus i. 1 plus i would take us out over here somewhere. And then if we divide by root 2, that's going to put us back on the unit circle. So that's a, another way of representing this complex number. So 1 plus i is actually uh, the vertex, or one of, one, of the, one of the little points over here that is on a square. And that square would sit over here, above the unit circle. And if we scale this point back down, that's going to put it right on this red circle. So that's one interesting point. Let's pick some other interesting point. Let's pick another point that is, uh, let's say, uh, this one over here. So 2 pi on 3. Let's pick that point. What is that going to be? If we put e to the i times 2 pi on 3, what are our real and imaginary components going to be? Well, if we go up over here, what is going to happen? This is our real component, and this is our imaginary component. So we're going to have minus 1 half plus i times root 3 on 2. So that's actually our real and our imaginary components. And this is a representation of this number over here. So this would be the polar form, and this would be the Cartesian form. And the reason I've picked these special values over here is they always give us nice representations in both the polar and the Cartesian form. It's rare that you find points that are both uh, beautiful in the Cartesian and the polar form. Usually, if they're, if they're beautiful in the polar form, they're going to be messy in the Cartesian form. Or if they're very nice in the Cartesian form, they're not going to have a very nice angle theta over here. But these guys are very special because they're those special points on the unit circle. So you can see that all of these points have very important uh, mathematical concepts associated with them, and they also have important applications in physics. This doesn't have to just be the complex plane. This can be the normal uh, unit circle in an xy axis. So we, if we have the Cartesian plane and we're not even worried about complex numbers, this is still a valid representation. But if we take that representation that we're used to from geometry and trigonometry and we combine it with Euler's formula and our understanding of complex exponentials, we can get all of this interesting mathematics that emerges from the unit circle. So we will be using these concepts in quantum mechanics, and it's very important to get a solid foundation. So I'd encourage you to try and reconstruct this entire unit circle and try and choose interesting points like these ones and write them both in polar and Cartesian form. That's going to be a very useful exercise to do, and it's going to give you uh, a lot of intuition as to how these numbers work. Because this is going to be very useful in quantum mechanics, especially when we look at the time evolution of systems in quantum mechanics. You can find all of the other videos in the quantum mechanics playlist.